So in this video, we're going to be speaking with somebody that I admire a lot. I've been a huge fan for as long as I've had a career. Maybe even before I started my career, actually. Because um, I was supposed to like intern for him one time. Anyway, so in this video, I'm going to be speaking to him. And we're going to talk about his career journey so far. He has a very interesting career journey. He started in growth or digital marketing. Then I like, went to core growth. And now is a junior software developer and i'm just like okay like not not a lot of people go from growth to software development because like we like where we are you know but he has done it or he's doing it and i'm just very intrigued i want to just learn um, learn some tips from him because he was like a good master and then also understand the thinking behind moving into software development and what it looks like starting from scratch in a totally new career path and so if you are interested in trying a different career you're interested in transitioning or you just want to understand some things about growth from his experience or right now learn from his experience as a sort of developer then you must stay and watch this video to the very end my guest for today is going to be justin Rebel, aka the wonder kind aka what else one boy yes that's it hi justin hi are you hi, excited justin. to be here uh, a little bit nervous <laughs> uh, if I'm that's right honest, but, um, yeah. I'm, I'm nervous too all the time so we're just going to like flow and have a conversation okay Stuff. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. Hey guys, thank you for staying to watch this video. My name is PC Timmy, and I'm very passionate about growing people and growing businesses. And that's what I try to do on this YouTube channel. So I create videos on branding, marketing, business, and life. And I have this series where I interview startup founders. So if this is your first time on this channel and you've never subscribed before, please, I beg your name of whatever you believe in, click on the subscribe button below to subscribe. There's also a bell notification button. If you click on it, then every time I release a video, which really I try to be at least once every week, you'll be one of the very first people to know. And if this is not your first time, you know how I feel about you because I say it all the time. I really love you. Thank you for being here again. Now, let's get into this video. Okay, so my very first question is, why did you get into software engineering? Just like, let's dive into it. So the very honest answer is, I have always wanted to be a software engineer. Oh yeah? Even long before I, I became a growth person. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so growth was, it was the easiest thing like if you think about a career like a set of stopping points mm. right it was easiest thing to transition from because before i was a growth person i worked in media mm. right and so i was like the editor-in-chief for some platform that was handled by ringe you know ringe media? yeah yeah so i was editor-in-chief for something called the nigerian bulletin at the time and uh it exposed me to the software engineers who were, who were operating the platform and, okay. I, I, and I admired them a lot, right? <laughs> and I wanted to be a software engineer, but I, it felt like the divide was too much, right? And so, True. what? yeah, so the next, the next logical leap for me was to think about going to the tech space. Mm. So I wanted to work in the in the in this general area of tech, which mm. is like Yabakon Valley, as people say. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I got my big break when I got an invitation to interview at hotels, right? And so, you know, given what I could do, right, the, the, the place that I saw myself playing in was head of content mm. at Hotels.ng. So I was head of content, then I became the head of marketing. And then, you know, so basically, like, it's a very long-winded route <laughs> to being a software engineer, but that was all the way But you're finally doing yeah, it. Yeah, precisely. So, That's yeah. very interesting. So let's talk about, like, the key yeah. um, stop points, as you called it right now. So yeah. you did head of marketing, head of content at Hotels. Yeah. Then you went to Jumia Food for, like, a couple of months, and you were head of marketing. Then you went to this company, this media company by Diary. Before that, I was at Big Cabal. Oh, before that, yes, you were at Big yeah, Cabal. Yeah. Um, and that's when um, the Nigeria talk show started. Yes, yes, precisely. And then you went to the media company. What's the yes. name of this one? Um, Live Spot. Live Spot. Yeah. And then Eden. Yeah. And then, yes. Yeah. So maybe as fast as we can, just talk yeah. about like, um, why did you move at different, at different points? And what was like the key takeaway from each of those experiences, starting from hotels, then Jumia? Okay, so, so, so honestly speaking, I was very restless, right? And it's something I'm trying to be mindful of even now as, as, a, as a software engineer. Mm. Um, so, you know, after a while, after my, when I came into hotels, we hadn't yet like set up the whole marketing department. Hotels right. NGI just been funded. Uh, we're thinking about expansion and so there's a lot of flurry of activity and that's like kind of place that I fit in when there's a lot of um, uncertainty yeah, about scope. Scrappiness. Yeah, you know, yeah, precisely. And so, you know, I had, had like a good run almost for two years, right? Mm. Worked there for almost two years. And that's years. been your longest. 
Yes, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm exactly the kind of person that people would not want to hire. <laughs> Where we would say, oh my God, I want someone who can work for four years. You're usually not that kind of guy. Um, but it's not, it's not, there is no, there is no mischief or, or um, there's no bad faith in it. It's just that I am, I am, I, I want to do a lot of things so quickly and sometimes <laughs> I get, I get, I get like, I, I run my course very quickly. Mm -hmm. So after I was done, done there, um, I got an offer at Jumia Food, which is funny because the reason I got that offer was because somebody wanted me to come head marketing at Cafe New mm -hmm. and I instead gave them advice for how they should think about marketing but shouldn't hire me. And then he recommended me to the head of marketing for to the head of, to, the, to the manager for Jumia Food Nigeria yeah. at the time. And then she interviewed with me, and then I got the job. Um, I had a good run, and while I was working there, I was it was pretty great. Like I actually what was liked, the best thing about working at Jumia Food. Um, so I would say that the best thing about working at Jumia Food is that it has more structure than every other place I've worked. Mm. Um, you know, they have like. Um, they have bands of employees, so you know, like I'm C two, C three. Actually, I can't remember which one I was, right? So it's like A to Fs, right? Mm. And they have like bands, and so you can know at any particular time what you need to do. To, to yeah, you know. So it's, it's a really structured workplace. So I liked it. Um, so while working while working there, I began to talk to Saruman, my friend, mm. who was working at um, Vicaba. Vicaba then, you know. And I, I was expressing concern about Zikoko because Zikoko was like. <laughs> was no longer as hot as it was when I remember, you know. Mm. And just my random talks with him, he went and told the CEO who scheduled a meeting with me, you know, and we got to talk to him and I like, caught like Zikoko fever, right? <laughs> so the funny thing was, I was just shit talking, like just like, why can't you guys do this? You know, that kind of thing. Like, you guys, you guys, you are sitting on a gold mine here, do something about it. And then, you know, I got, I got invited to, to lead the team. So I was head of, um, I was head of, no, I was, I was actually head of growth at, okay. at, um, at, um, um I was editor in chief for Zikoko. Right. Um, so you went back to media. Yes. Yeah. So I I I I, I also led product for something we were building at the time. Mm. Um, it was um, the CEO's brain and brainchild. So it was called Formation. So this would be like the proprietary CMS mm. for for Zikoko at the time. And then I I went on to be head of client services. Right. So I was I was wearing different hats at different times at Zikoko. So it was very difficult from, from the outside looking in to tell mm. what I was doing, right? right? But I, 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 so the reason why I was head of client service was because we had like to figure out like, you know, cash flow and mm. everything. And so I used to go for meetings, used to put on the suit and all that. <laughs> my, I can't imagine my, my, my it. Least, my least favorite job description. But it was, it was great, it was interesting. Um, and how did, how did Nigeria Talk should come about? So Nigeria Talk is, uh, it's, I don't know whose brainchild it is, but I know it was spearheaded by Jola, mm. right? So Jola was in charge of that project, right? So we're, we're thinking about new forms of media, new forms of content. And um, I would say like Jola and Shola Lawal, um, Shola Lawal is a, like, a pretty super cool <laughs> media journalist right now. They, they, they created like Nigeria's talk, which, right. which the idea was to, because one thing Zikoko had was a lot of goodwill. Mm. And so we had access to a lot of people who wanted to be in front of the camera. And so we needed to figure out synergy and chemistry. Mm. So most of the time when you saw like a video out there, which we shot like a lot of takes, mm. right? And then, so you, you, over time, you began to see like combinations of people. Those two people had chemistry, you know, when, when you put, put, put them in front of the camera, they just keep on talking and you get some gold <laughs> from it, right? It was, um, at the time, it was really like genius stuff, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't like really difficult for us to pull off, right? Um, I will, I will, I will give all credit to Jola and um, Shola. They really made people get very comfortable. I used to drink on set, right? Because, <laughs> I because, because, because I used, I, I had, I, I had, used to admire that show a lot. Yeah, I had nerves, so the, so I would drink on set, and then I would just let loose. And apparently, <laughs> it was funny. Uh, so half the time I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back to watch all the episodes and picture you guys. It's, it's why I was saying a lot of rubbish. If you watch it, you see I, I said a lot of rubbish, but it was fun, you know. Uh, so yeah, that was. Uh, uh, it's also generally unscripted, so they give you the topic. You will not be asked any questions beforehand, so you don't rehearse anything, and then you just speak, right? Yeah. And we, so like I said, it's just like pure. It was a pure chemistry play. Um, not all videos were usable, but most of them were good. So, <laughs> so how long did you spend at Zikoko? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I know it wasn't very long. It was probably a couple of months. We had uh, we had a pitch of uh, an operational challenge, yeah. as I like to call it. So you know, it's I love my work there, but I could we could not continue. Mm. Um, so we had to shut down for a bit, and so you know that's what that's what, that's what led to my transition to Lightspot. Yeah, and, yeah. and how is that? The the work at Lightspot. Yeah, uh, it was great. Uh, I. I, uh, I had become very interested in the creative space at that particular point mm -hmm. and, and 
So I wanted to know, so between, before, like, between Lightspot and I was doing two things. I wanted to break into the full on like media creative space, which is like the animators and the graphic yeah. designers and all of that. And then um, Lightspot was in the experiential marketing space and they were looking on to take on more more departments, so advertising, digital marketing and everything. So I, right. I fell into digital marketing, right? And so I, I had the opportunity of collaborating with a lot of um, um, creatives, right? Um, did a lot of good launches too, right? So like the Tiger, Tiger Beer, um, this is a bunch of like, a lot of, a lot of experiential and digital marketing yeah. campaigns, like at that time, it was a flurry of activity, right? I get a lot of, gained a lot of experience. So ultimately it was great, you know. <laughs> uh, and but, we then left to go to Eden. Yes. But I followed your career so well. <laughs> so when I said like, I've actually been like a serious admirer, I mean it. Because yeah. I'm actually impressed we have been calling like all the steps. Yeah, so so Eden, yes. Um, Eden again, my friend was Harriman, you know, just talked to me about Eden. And I was like, I remember the day I first talked to Nadia, Nadia is CEO of Eden. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was pacing in my room for like a couple hours and we are just talking back and forth, you know. And I really liked the idea. So. So we got to talking and everything, and I, I was gonna, I was gonna um, consult for Eden for the launch, yeah. you know. So just basically, lay out the steps for the marketing yeah, campaign market. launch and everything, and um, and they had already had like a whole marketing team, I believe, or head of marketing at the time. And so my job was to interface with the guy yeah. to make sure that everything went 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 according to plan. That did not quite pan out properly, right? So instead of a consultation, now they started talking to me about coming to assume the role. <laughs> uh, so you know, I. Uh, I, I, I took it. It, it, was, it was fun, you know. Um, I mean, Eden, Eden, I'm very, very proud of the work Eden does, <laughs> right? And people are like hyping Eden on Twitter. I'm like, yeah. That's Started my, that. That's my company. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, uh, so yeah, did, did, um, did some, did a year and a half, I think. Oh, it was that long? Yeah, I think, I think it was a, either a year and a half or close to. I don't remember now. My memory is insane. Close to a year, probably. I think it's close to a year. Mm. Um, more than a year, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, so at that time I was also in Lambda School. So, you know, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Lambda School, by the way, is the, is the software engineering school that I attended, mm. right? So 11 months of Lambda School and yeah, voila. Yeah. So coming here, just before we like go and talk yeah. really a lot about the software engineering part, yeah. um, I'm most curious about what, what has informed so far, aside yeah. the fact, aside software engineering, your move throughout the digital marketing media career, what really has informed the choice of companies you work for, the roles yeah. that you take at every time? Okay, so for hotels or NG, I only wanted to be in tech. That was the only thing, right? I was working in media, I wanted to come into tech, mm. right? And um, Mark Essien and I, we, we vibed mm. very well on the very first interview. So, you know, that was like a done deal. Um, there was not a lot of clarity in that kind of focus thing when I went to Jumia Food. Mm. All I know was that at that particular point, I felt like I had done everything I needed to do at hotels, mm. right? And I, so I needed like a, a change something of pace, different. yeah, something new, right? I honestly had like plans for Zikoko, <laughs> like, so it's not like it's not so much I wanted to work as Zikoko, but I wanted these things to, to happen, <laughs> right, as Zikoko. And so I used to always bother my friend Osara Man. Anytime we met at Cafe I'm like, why is Zikoko not doing this? Because Zikoko could be doing this and everything, and so. That kind of conversation, I will follow him home <laughs> and I'll still tell him about what Zikoko should be doing, was what led the CEO to speak to me. I was like, you know what? You know, like Drake said, you know, somebody might as well do it, mm. right? And if no one's going to do it, then I might as well do it, right? And so, like, so that was what made me work at, um, at, um, at Zikoko. By the time I was done with Zikoko Arc, I was actually also done with tech, mm. right? So I was, I, was, I was done with tech, I was burnt out, I'm not going to lie, right? So, I wanted to try something new and I'd already like had my eyes on advertising. Right. right? Yes. And so, you know, I was starstruck the first time I met Dari. Yeah. <laughs> Dari Talade. Imagine. Yeah. And uh, I just just share scope of the whole work, just knowing that it's like an end to end creative digital marketing type mm. thing. You so know? you could be involved in yeah. everything. Yeah. So I was like, you know what, if I stay here, I'm going to like get the general gist of this whole industry. I, and I did, just that I found out that. Uh, was on the industry for me <laughs> and so so um at this particular point i was already i pretty much applied to lambda school i was waiting for the verdicts and then i started talking to NAND. and then i realized there was a gap in my whole digital marketing slash growth mm. um, experience which is that i had never worked with a pre-product market fit company right that was the one draw that eden had for me right 
like we did not know everything everything was up to anybody's guess mm. you know and i'd never had that kind of uncertainty before you know mm. like by the time i was working at hotels or ng we already had to run market fit mm. you know and so it was just like figuring out how can yes, we how expand the cohorts you know do affiliative um, affiliated audiences and everything but with with eden the, all the customers were friends of the team mm. you get and so those people there's not a lot of um profiling and yeah. data to glean from They're just your friends who like you <laughs> <laughs> right and so we needed to figure out like messaging figure out brand colors on the flight we're changing a lot of things every day mm. and people were, we're breaking things more than we're moving fast right and that was like probably one of the most thrilling adventures of my life mm. you know um in fact by the time i've done like a year we already started entering into that place where we now began to have authoritative arguments about things where we're like no 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 this is this what is we're <laughs> yeah before that we didn't know anything so could, everything could just happen every, honestly honestly speaking right we used to do a lot of things very quickly one of the very first things we did at Eden I don't know if you if you if you saw it we used to do free lunches to people mm. right and the idea made sense in theory right that's the funny thing it made sense we, we did like a whole brainstorm like okay you know what um eight people are concerned about you know the because there are two switching costs when it comes to Eden, right? Mm. There's a financial one, which is easy to reason about, but there's also the cost of switching from your current provider, mm. right? Which is a lot because you have to like overhaul your entire schedule, mm. you know, to connect with yeah. Edens. Yeah. And so we gave the opportunity, you know, free, free experience, right? And then, you know, if it works for you, we yeah, just continue right. the plan. And the core idea being that we do a lot of background profiling, right? To be able to figure out like, this is the kind of person who is more likely to use Eden, but this is the one barrier they you just don't have the, mm. there's no trial and it's just too much of a commitment, right? And you know, like the very first cycles of the thing, excellent stuff, you know? And then after that, you know, because once you get like the very high quality, you then have to drop down to, and over, over time, you know, the cost of that experience began to outweigh the, the value, you know? And that was to me, by the way, like in all the things that we did, that was to me one of the, even as simple as one of the most innovative ways mm. that we were able to break down that barrier because the outcome of people now telling people about Eden, saying, oh my God, Eden, Eden experience and everything, all those people, they are like the descendants of people mm. who are descendants of people who use Eden for free. Mm. Do you get? And so even though we couldn't look too far into the future, right, because we're like, if people are not converting this month, then we are dead in three months, right? That's, that's how I always had to think about it, right? But even though we could not have that kind of long-term vision, just starting at that beginning point, right, began to spawn more people and just an, a whole ecosystem of small experiments that we're running every single time, you know, has given birth to this brand mm. that it is today. And no matter how much of, a, of how, how much foresight we had, because not have expected it. <laughs> and, and so this is the first time that I'm, part of the beginning of a brand as mm. opposed to inheriting the brand and growing the brand mm. and so it's like it has like a very special place yeah in my heart, very you know? sentimental yeah precisely so like, when, by the time you left you then yeah. did you guys like did you guys say oh yes we have product market fit now or it was after you left that you figured oh i think yes this has happened uh so the thing about product market fit is like this is the moving target right um we are on our way to having product market fit but it's the kind of um, market where you want something um, so like it's a market within a market within a market right mm. so that's the thing about so if you if Eden works within the tech community because you might know that Eden like really, really big within the tech community yeah. right that's a market but that's not the market right mm. but that market can have behaviors of the market you really want to you want, you want to you want to acquire in the, in the in the end so I would say that we are on the way we're really on that way to having product market fit right because um, we, we're always talking to customers. One thing that we did at Eden was we were like, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're really tiny. Mm. And so we can literally talk to every single customer we have. Yeah. And we really did that to the point of almost spamming, right? <laughs> I used to go to houses, right? I used to go to customers' houses. I'd be like, what are you doing on Saturday? Can I come over and visit, right? And then they would talk to me, you know, write a lot of notes, distribute, have meetings. And, and you know, like, as soon as people began to feel that they contributed to the product and the product began to shape up in, then we're hitting product market fit, mm. right? And so it's like those people, those people had like maybe ten friends that they would then recommend, and then we'll be like, okay, you know what? We're getting more of these kinds of people. But how can we get more people who are less like them, but just shared like the same core attributes? So that because ultimately we want the market to be as big as possible, mm. right? Um, so in terms of product market fit, I would say I would split it instead of thinking about Eden as a whole. I think about Eden's products because Eden has different products. Mm. 
the food product has hit product market fit. Yeah. You know? um, I don't know about now because it's been about since I worked at Eden, but I, I think like the food product hit product market fit. Then there are a few other services that need to hit product market fit, and then we can now then think back to the whole Eden bundle. Mm. You know because. There are like two two things. I like the way you're still saying we. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There are like two things right, when it comes to Eden, right? There's using Eden, which to me I think like the Eden experience, the whole end-to-end -end experience, right? It's like I move into I move into a house right now and I just like use Eden and Eden does the cleaning, yeah. does the laundry and everything. Then there's like using an Eden service, right? Yeah. Which to me is not particularly using Eden. It's like it's like uh, the entry point into using Eden, mm. right? Once you have a lot of faith in Eden, giving, you handling your food, then you should be able to like offload more and more chores to Eden. So that part is the part that once Eden locks in product market fit, then it will just grow like spontaneously. So yeah, that's that's what I mean. What I mean when I say like a moving yeah. target, like you have to think about all of those. I'm, I'm so impressed yeah. by how excited you still are about the company. <laughs> so when you actually said there's probably the most life changing career choice, you actually oh, did yeah. mean it. Yeah, like like I, I I can now have strong opinions about like <laughs> how when you say be scrappy, move fast and break things. I've never really moved fast and broken things until Eden. <laughs> I broke a lot of things, but very stressful, but still. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so my final question just about your good career yeah. is what would you say has been like the top three lessons yeah. that you've learned being a digital marketer or a good marketer? One one lesson that I've learned, I don't know if it's lessons, if it's a lesson or anything, but I think people both simultaneously underestimate and overestimate the importance of instinct when it comes to group mm. marketing, right? Uh, ultimately like a lot of a lot of things go down to your intuition, how you feel about something, right? Why I say people overestimate it is that many people then tend to lean heavily about how they, into how they feel. And what I mean why I say people underestimate it is also that if you know that intuition is the ultimate like final say, you might gather your data, you might think through the entire pipeline, you might do everything. Ultimately, gut feel, mm. right? There was a there was a framework for for campaigns, right? Is how qualified is your team to use a specific channel? Mm. for growth. So ultimately, like, not all channels are equal, mm -hmm. right? It's a function of your skill, mm. right? And it's a function of the expected value of that channel, mm. right? So you have to combine, can this team execute with this channel? Well, how much value? So are we doing too much work for this little growth on this channel? And finally, there's gut feel. Mm. How do you feel about the channel overall, you mm. know? And the reason why I say it's underestimated is that if you agree that your intuition is the most important, it's also very important yeah, in the, in the whole, in the grand scheme of things, then you want to feed your intuition, you know, high value substrates, mm. right? So you want to get very good and coming to snap decisions that are sound. And that's by exposing yourself to a lot of heuristics, um, tools, and, you know, thinking yeah. about, about coming to the right decisions. So that's one thing I learned, right? Um, I learned to become, to have like really good instincts about mm. growth. Um, it's, it's, it's from everything, from the copy, from the, from the campaigns, from the colors, from the customer support, from retention efforts. Just knowing like if somebody comes into the pipeline, right? Just the way you acquire that person can tell you precisely when that person will turn because of the shoddy job you did in the acquisition process, right? So the, the quality of the acquisition can give you insight into the, mm. the, the churn in the future, mm. um, you know? So that's one. Another thing that I learned is that um, when it comes to growth marketing, to digital marketing, there's a lot, and this, this stresses me out by the way, <laughs> there's a lot that is out of your control, right? There's a lot that is out of your scope, right? And for somebody like me who is a bit of a, a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to these things, it kind of gives me a lot of anxiety, right? Mm. Knowing that, like, they, like people say, now go to bring customer. <laughs> that thing stresses me so much, right? Um, so with software engineering, for example, I have tickets to fix and I fix those tickets and I can say, I fix this ticket. The marketing is like, there's a number of random occurrences that lead the customer down your pipeline. <laughs> and you only have, you can trick yourself until you believe in you have so much control, but you only have so much control yeah. like over that pipeline, right? So um, the ability to, to, to tell yourself the right stories about how customers are interacting with you is very good because once you know, so some people, for example, cannot even, they can't reason about how customers flow down their pipelines mm. at all. Some people can't just think about it, right? If you can't come with a, with a high fidelity rendition of that kind of pi pipeline, how you think about where does this person exist? Mm. What is the first touch point, right? And how long does it take, right? So let me give another example with Eden, right? Um, 
I knew after a few months of working at Eden that it took almost three and a half months from first interaction, no, three and a half weeks from first interaction to conversion, mm. right? I knew that because I was measuring it, right? And obviously that was unacceptable for me because at that point, all your attribution analysis, all your windows, your decay, it's, it's hard to, yeah. you know, at this point you're just guessing, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, a lot of the work we did was to shorten that time. Mm. All the app, we were kept on launching new versions of the app, kept on launching new versions of the website, everything. I think there was one time someone said, are we, are we eating or are we a website? <laughs> and it's true, we used to do that over yeah. and over again. We kept on shipping multiple versions of the website, right? And like, it meant like lots of sleepless nights. You know, so the ability to, to, you know, tell yourself the right stories about how customers are coming to your pipeline, absolutely magnificent and it works like it's agnostic it works outside of marketing right even if you're going to do a job you can think about how your employer potential yeah. employer is interacting with all that candidates with you and how you are flowing down the pipeline and what other considerations they are making when they're shopping for for, for, for employees, employees right? so it, it really helps uh those are the two things uh do i have a third thing uh, i think everybody should read um avinash right kaushik is my avinash kaushik um, you know him, right? Yeah, I do. The, the analytics guy, right? That's my, that's my number one learning, right? Made me a bit cynical, right? Mm. Reading him, but um, it made me more methodical and able to defend my craft mm. better than anything I had ever consumed up to that point. So those are my three learnings in marketing, right? Like anytime people ask me, I'm like, yeah, you know, be a lot more in depth when it comes to your funnel, right? Don't assume things, don't assume yeah. too many things. And also, you know, your instincts. Trust your instincts. Also, feed your instinct the right content so your instincts get better. <laughs> you know, and also read Avinash. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, I, I feel like I just went through a good masterclass. To be honest, yeah. after this, I'm just gonna like, go into check everything that I do at growth and just make sure that yes, I'm actually on point. <laughs> but so now yeah. you've left growth completely, yeah. or just for the time being. So. Or as in, spirit leads. So I am. I am growth adjacent right now, right? I do like some consultations for companies, mm. right? Um, that's the amount of work I can do. So if I don't have to handle your day to day, perfect, I can work with you. If you have a marketing team on ground and you know, maybe they are a little bit not as senior as you want them to be right now, mm. but they are really, you know, excited young creative people, then you can get me on board as your, as your uh, okay. consultant. And I just check in and I say, you know, this is, you know, um, that works for me. Um, it's a little bit less exciting <laughs> than I would prefer. I don't get my hands dirty at all. Um, but yeah, that's what I do now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a software engineer quickly, right? mm. which means I don't want to be a junior for very long. And so I have to. What's the know, timeline? So <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be very controversial because, <laughs> like, engineers have op strong opinions about this, right? Yeah. They're like, you can't be a senior in one year. That's crap. But I'll be a senior in a year or two, right? Okay. Um, so worst case scenario two years. Eh? Worst case scenario two years. Yes, yes. Um, so you know, I, 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 I think that when it comes to marketing, um, to software engineering, there is there is only so much you can you can um, accomplish by reading, which is mm. somewhat different from marketing. I am yeah. finding right. A lot of the skills I gain as a marketer came from like really intense studying, right? Just studying campaigns, studying pipelines, studying growth courses and all that. With, with respect to software engineering, a lot of it is in the muscle memory, mm. right? So, because you're interfacing with a machine, right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a function of how much logic you have absorbed and how much of the paradigms and they call them um, design patterns that you have absorbed that can help you like make snap decisions about machines. So the difference between a junior and a senior is that a, a senior has like a lot more of muscle. that muscle memory yeah. and they know like how to like think about things, right? A junior will probably get some low quality outcome and it will take a very longer time. So they're much slower. And so uh, I have prioritized working at a company that lets me, you know, fiddle with a lot more things than usual. So like my current job. Um, What's your current job? I, I, work, I work in the, so I, I, I can't say my company, I can't mention my company's name, but I would okay. just, I work in fintech, I work in, um, for a company in Europe, mm. and uh, they, they basically provide like a, 
a bunch of APIs out of the box. So if you wanted to do, if you wanted to run a company like Bamboo, for example, you could right. you could get the stock market API from us. And right. so you just have to build the app. You don't have to think about the integrations and everything. Mm -hmm. You just give you the app. If you wanted to build like a buy coins and everything, we also give you the the cryptocurrency APIs and everything. So any as long as it's fintech, we have the APIs for it, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll help you on board every we'll do the whole thing. It's a really, really intense tool toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. And so my job is to manage the core tool toolkit, right? So when um, the customers ask for features, I add something to the API, right. which in the beginning was really absolutely terrifying for me because they use like a monolithic structure. So when right. I had to get like the whole code base and I work on the front end and the back end on a full stack, mm. I had like two gigantic code bases on my, on my machine. My laptop crashed the very, <laughs> my, my very first week of onboarding. And I'm like, I'm never going to understand this, right? And then my team was like, there's only one thing that you need to really understand this. You need to be like consensuous, right? Mm. And you have that a lot. Stay up, do it. And funnily enough, this week I had to work on my first full feature. What I mean by full feature is like end to end. Um, I did the design for the for the user interface. They implemented it on the front end, created the APIs on the back end, right? And connected both so of them. So from together. design to front end, yes. back end. Yes, everything. I wow. Did, I did everything, right? And so every day he was messaging me like, do you need help? And I was like, no, I don't need help. And I needed help, but I wanted to be sure that I could figure it out on my own. And he reviewed my work and he was like, it's pretty great, you know? And, and so yeah, that's what I mean when I say I want to be a senior engineer, right? I want to be able to, because I find that like, if he had taught me everything and I would not absorb the mm. lessons that I was also learning. So I wanted to like fumble in the dark for a while. And I just need more exposure to those kind of things, right? So over time, I imagine that in a few months, right, when somebody points out a problem with a specific service on the okay. API, I can just say, yes, I know where it is and I can make the right decisions. And I think that would be an invaluable skill. Mm. And so, you know, so the reason why I want to be a senior is that software engineering has no law for juniors, absolutely none, right? It's terrifying to be a junior. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding, it's, it's terrifying. There is almost no law for juniors, right? So I want to be, a junior as little as possible, mm. right, and move on to seniority level. So if you are a junior in any company, right, some concessions are being made for you, mm. you know? And I don't like that. It's like, if anything came to a head, the juniors would be let go because right. they're a little bit of an overhead to the company overall, mm. you know? So it's like, they measure junior time in senior hours. Mm. So it's like, if we hire a junior, how much senior hours will it cost? Mm. So you can't hire a junior without a senior. Mm. And if the senior is busy, then the junior can't work. You know, because the senior has to oversee and manage and everything. And it's, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't think I've it's ever, I don't think all my life I've been working, I've ever been a junior. Mm. You know, so this is the first time that I've had like somebody come in and say, can I check your work? That has never happened in my and entire And how are you handling it? I've learned a lot of humility. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am completely unrecognizable even to myself, right? I'm just like, hi, um, can you please look at my work and know that I have done something wrong? I just don't have the facilities to know what I did wrong. So please, just check my work. I'm like, oh, it's great. I'm like, yeah, really, just patronizing me, but I'll take it for now. You know? So, so yeah, that's how it's like. Amazing. And yeah. I know that right now you're also an anti um, entrepreneur. Yes. So. I, so I think the question is. Although, although I have to say that that I I, I put on hold. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, I could not. So I don't know how much you know about Antler. I know it's an incubator. Yes. They match with co-founders. Yes, precisely. So I would have I would have had to spend a couple months in in Nairobi. Mm. Um, and I kind of weighed it because I, I was coming in as a technical founder, right? Mm. Um, with a bunch of other Lambda grads, by the way. So it's like you get paired with a business founder. Right. You know. In all honesty, even though I passed, I, I passed and I have like I, I still have it provisionally. I'm not confident in my technical skills mm. to be able to deliver something that is like cutting edge slash competitive, and I'm always mindful of that. Mm. So there is a world where I switch over to be like a hundred percent Antler Antler entrepreneur, and I don't think that I will grow so fast as an engineer, right? Mm. So I, I had like this nail biting consideration phase, right? And I had like a lot of advice, and finally I sent the email to Antler telling them that I would like to put it on hold, right? Which I, I imagine that like in a year or two, right, when I am a much better software engineer, mm. I can build stuff. Um, I asked a few senior engineers, you know, people who work in like artificial intelligence, machine learning and everything. And like, like ultimately, you won't be able to build anything really robust as a junior 
So you will lock in some kind of CRUD, create, read, update, delete app type system, which I can do now, right? Which is probably enough to launch a product before you hit, you know, product market fit, and then you can then employ yeah, more the powerful engineers and everything. Yeah. And then, you know, it's great, right? It will give me like entrepreneur status. <laughs> um, which is something to be, you you know, it's something, it's something to covet, right? But I have to think more, more long term. So you know, so I am provisionally still an Angular entrepreneur. It's just that I, I kind of deferred it just so I could spend more time writing code. It's the hardest decision I ever had to make because I want to be an, <laughs> yeah. I was very excited about it, but I yeah. had to think about it. Like, I have made some kind of decisions in the past that have done that have been like. That have kind of truncated my growth, for example, mm. and I'm trying not to make that kind the of decision, right? It's like being a junior is excruciating, right? But you know, it's finite to end at some point, and then I'll be a senior. But if I become an angler entrepreneur and as a technical founder, I force myself to be a senior too quickly, mm. and I might never have some foundation. I may never be able to go back to learning those foundationals, and it's like. You know, I don't know if, if it's a good bet I have made. I <laughs> uh, will find out. So the end goal is yeah. entrepreneurship status. Oh yes, yes. I want to create business value, yeah. right? I also want to be like a, a technically competent leader. Two things that are like diametrically opposed to each other. <laughs> Not really diametrically opposed, but you can be one without the other. Mm. You can create business value without being a technical person. And you can also be technical without creating business that. value. Um, I want to do both, right? I want to be able to... I'm thinking in terms of creating platforms, right? Mm. Where, you know, because the ability to create a platform is that you you are the pipe between two things, two people that probably are currently connected in inefficient ways, mm. right? And so you're the platform that brings them together. So ultimately, the, you distribute, you take some value for yourself, but you increase the overall value. And I think that the only way to create that kind of thing in this world is by really, really being technically competent. Mm. Like you can't, you can't be a rookie and build a platform. I don't know that there's anyone who's done that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more long term now. Yeah. Amazing. So yeah. my final question. Yeah. Um, a lot of people now are trying to like figure out their career. I was having a call yeah. with um, one of my schoolmates today and he's like, he got an offer and then he got two offers and he's trying yeah. to figure out the best one. But he's also like, he feels like he should stay in his company because he's been there for just nine months and he was in another company for like six months and everybody's yeah. like, people in tech move forward. He's like, so I don't know what to do. Do yeah. I stay? Do I take this offer? Do I take that offer? I mean, I gave him my advice. Yeah. Then I will say on camera. Yeah. Uh, but I'm curious to what you think, right? Because you've had a very interesting group. Just like you said, you're very restless and you yeah. move really quick. Yeah. Um, what would be your advice to other people? Would it be like a do the same thing, don't? What's that one or two? Yeah. If you're going to mentor someone and just say, hey, I just got out of school yeah. and I'm trying to figure shit out, what would you yeah. tell them? Um, so I, I, I think that you should always have like two modes when you think about work, right? The very, when you are starting out in your career, you want to learn very quickly, right? It's great if the place you get to work and learn quickly pays very well, mm. right? But even if it doesn't, you should prioritize learning very quickly. And one sign that I'm finding to be like the most robust way of learning very quickly is if when you come in, people throw you in the thick of things, right? If you get the opportunity to work in a place where you are just thrown in the, in the action, right? And it's guided. So it's not like you're just left to your own devices. You are put in the middle, on the, on the battleground, and then you have like somebody saying, do this and do that, right? You learn very quickly, right? So, like I always say, like, the one thing that was, like, really super foundational for me was working at Hotels at NG. Mm. Mark Essien has a very specific way of leading teams. He believes that he doesn't, he doesn't really particularly care about your age, mm. right? It's like, even if you're 19, he's just going to throw you in the middle yes. of something. And if you don't get results, you know, it's just <laughs> going to, right? And so that kind of thing, it, it was stressful, but it made me learn a lot very quickly, right? And so, like, at that particular point in my life, that's the kind of work I needed to do, right? But after you pick up the kind of knowledge and everything, you don't want to do that kind of work. There's a kind of work where you now trust people to trust you mm. to do your job. Mm. So think Eden, mm. right? And so when it comes to careers and people are trying to figure out their careers, like, like in the beginning, when you know that you don't know anything, you want to learn on the company's dime, mm. right? And so you need to 
you need to meet, you need to work at a company where the company has the philosophy that they don't expect you to know a lot, but they expect you to learn quickly. Mm. That kind of mix, they don't expect you to know a lot, but they expect you to learn very quickly. It's, 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 it yeah, it's gunpowder, right? So do that, right? And then when you know you know a lot, you will know, right? Mm. And then the instant you want to do is that you want to go test those skills in the world with as little supervision as possible, mm. right? So you now want to begin like be the person who gets to lead and you want to test the, your flavor of leadership and self-direction. Um, that's the only two things. So if you are working in a company where you learn a lot, Right? and you've been working there for a few months and then you get an offer, you are taking a risk where is that you are potentially going to shake your growth mm. too early. It's like, are you learning? Are you moving fast? Right? Then let it run its course. Right? Mm. Don't shake it because when you switch over, you're going to have the whole on onboarding. You're going to be introduced to new tools. You're going to... And that's Everything, time. Yeah. You know? And so and at the end of the day, after all that time is gone, it's like, it's a dynamic as fast paced and everything and I know most people cannot think like in terms of real-time considerations yeah. it's like if I move from this job to the next my salary is going to 2x mm -hmm. right but you don't know the percentage to which your, your income is going to 2x if you just stayed at this current job mm. we're not earning a lot but if you did a year or two it's rockets for you mm. so I just say just those two modes right when you are beginning when you don't know anything prioritize your learning learning on the company's dime mm. right so one thing is that you have people who are young inexperienced who get to work at the company and they're not learning on the company's dime the company is currently is exploiting them mm. right that's a bad arrangement so don't do that so right <laughs> yeah so learn on the company's dime right and the only way to learn on the company's dime is that the company itself wants you to learn on this dime you can't trick a company into, yeah into, so you're just be yeah. very particular about the kind of companies yeah. you work for when yes you're starting yes right, right. and then further further down the line like i'm thinking a year or two if you're in tech right very quickly take up like a a team lead type position mm. that will accelerate your career very quickly mm. right don't be afraid to fail don't be afraid to ask questions crave community something i've never been able to do right <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a very communal person but you should crave community within your your space right so you have to grow very fast right um yeah that's pretty much it amazing thank you so much justin yeah. this is like as amazing as i thought it would be when i was thinking about the invite so i'm super excited it's probably going to be one of my favorite videos i'm not going to add anything because i feel like if you missed anything or you can't remember the beginning just go back and watch the whole video again it was just very interesting learning about justin's career how he has gone from hotels or ng to leading growth at eden to going to advertising and then now starting as a junior software developer and also telling us about his future plans so i'm wishing you all the luck i'm still going thank to you. just keep looking around and stalking you for the rest of your career <laughs> but hey Thank you so much for being yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Piz. Awesome. This this was this was awesome. Amazing. Yeah. So guys, subscribe and you can follow Justin on Twitter at Life of Mogwai. That's it. Alright guys, peace out. <laughs>